Good morning. How are y'all doing? Good. Hey, I wanted to, um, before we get started, make a, one announcement. Um, we're getting ready for our next Helen Foster lecture, which will be coming up pretty real soon, actually. And uh, I think y'all enjoy this immensely. But we're doing this in partnership with Reed's Gumtree Bookstore. Uh, mark your calendar for Wednesday, June 13th. Um, we're actually going to have our reception before the program. So on Wednesday, June 13th at 7 p.m., we're going to be downstairs and we're going to have some, some wine and cheese and other goodies for y'all to enjoy. And then the, um, the program will start a little later than usual. It'll start at 8 o'clock. But um, I think y'all will definitely want to be here for this. Uh, we're going to be featuring uh, author John Meacham. Yes, exactly. He will be talking about his new book, The Soul of America, and also signing his book. So this is quite a, uh, talking to Jack Reed about this, that this is quite a accomplishment that he's going to be here in Tupelo and, uh, you know, John Meacham, Pulitzer Prize winning author. You know, they, they're here all the time in Tupelo, what can we say? So... Um, Y'all do mark your calendar, June 13th, uh, come and have some goodies at 7, and then uh, the author will be um, on stage, and Jack Reed's going to have a conversation with him, you know, kind of a little interview style on stage, and that should be really enjoyable. So uh, we'll see y'all then. Margaret? Thank you for coming out today, and welcome to Lunching with Books. Um, our reviewer today is Sonia Jenkins, and she would not give me a, a bio, so she says I know her well enough, so I'll tell you what I know. This could be dangerous, Sonia. Uh, first of all, she, she, is, uh, she is from Macomb, Mississippi, and uh, she is an attorney, and she attended the University of Mississippi and the University of Mississippi School of Law. And she uh, was a practicing attorney with Mitchell McNutt and Sams for several years. And now she is the legal counsel for Methodist Senior Services. And today she will be reviewing Sisters in Law uh, about Sandra Day O'Connor and uh, Ruth Gator Bader Ginsburg. Or is it Gins Ginsburg? Ginsburg. And, um, Anyway, I am, I'm quite a fan of both, and uh, when uh, Sandra Day O'Connor came to Ole Miss to speak many, many years ago, I went over there to, to hear her, and she was uh, quite exceptional. But anyway, we have an exceptional, uh, gifted reviewer today, and I want you to know that Sonia Jenkins has rescued me many, many times at Lunching with Books. Uh, you never know when some important reviewer might cancel or something, but Sonia is always prepared. She can, she's always got a book to review. So anyway, Sonia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I look out and I just see all of you who are near and dear to me and have uh, been friends of mine and have helped me along the way since I've been here in Tupelo, so I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Uh, way back in 1869, Myra Bradwell of Illinois applied to the Illinois Supreme Court to become the first woman in the United States admitted to the practice of law. She was rejected because she was a married woman and thus presumably unable to keep legal confidences. <laughs> yeah, so all you married women can't keep a secret. I don't know how that happens. On appeal, the United States Supreme Court agreed. It reasoned, the natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. The constitution of the family organization 
which is founded in the divine ordinance as well as in the nature of things indicates the domestic sphere as that which properly belongs to the domain and function of womanhood. The High Court further opine that the paramount destiny and mission of woman are, the, are to fulfill the noble and benign office of wife and mother. In other, in other words, women do not belong in the hallways of Lady Justice. And I find it ironic that justice is always symbolically portrayed by a woman. Girl, Girl power. As a graduate of the University of Mississippi School of Law, class of 1981, I stand before you today as a woman, neither delicate nor deferential, who has really had the good fortune and privilege of practicing law for almost 40 years in the state of Mississippi and most of those years here in Tupelo. I, I don't think there was really ever a time in my life that I felt like I could not be whatever I wanted to be and do what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the president of the student body at Demon Junior High School. First woman. Well, I ran and I was elected, so I was the first girl president at Demon Junior High. I really wanted to be in Omicron Delta Kappa at Ole Miss, so I advocated for the selection of women into this academic honorary and became one of the first four women admitted to ODK at Ole Miss. I wanted to be a member of the Tupelo Kiwanis Club. Were you the first? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I did. I became a member in the late 1980s and later um, its first female president. Now, I will say, I got into Kiwanis, but I could tell that I, it wasn't that I wasn't welcome. It was just, there was a little suspicion. And I figured out if I could just sit back at the very back table with Cybernet and Sun Pucket, there was a group of them. And so I proceeded to make that my table. And at first it was cold, but it warmed up. And honestly, those men just became such great friends of mine and really sort of warmed up the entire club. I, that was an, that's an honor for me. I enjoyed my time at Tupelo Kiwanis. It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous asset to our community, as is all of our, our um, uh, civic organizations. My parents never held me back. They always encouraged uh, my endeavors. I had wonderful teachers and professors who inspired my ambitions. And then I had good and progressive people especially in this community, who championed me. However, my journey in the legal profession really has been relatively free of bias and obstacles and discrimination. But that was only made possible by many brilliant, uncompromising, and brave women lawyers who paved the way for equality and inclusion for all. Two of those extraordinary women are the subjects of my review today of the book entitled Sisters in Law, How Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg Went to the Supreme Court and Changed the World. The author is Linda Hirschman. And to set the stage, let me just begin by reading from the introduction of the book. On the morning of June 26, 1996, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the second woman appointed to the High Court since its founding, slipped through the, the red velvet curtain behind the bench and took her seat at the end. Five places along the majestic curve sat Sandra Day O'Connor, justice since 1981, the first woman on the Supreme Court, or the FWOTSC, as she slyly referred to herself. Each woman justice sported an ornamental white collar on her somber black robe, but otherwise there was no obvious link between 
the, the first and second, any more than between any of the other justices. On that day, however, the public got a rare glimpse of the ties that bound the two most powerful women in the land. Speaking from the depths of the high back chair that towered over her tiny frame, Justice Ginsburg delivered the decision of the court in United States versus Virginia. From that morning in June 1996, Virginia's state-run military institute, which had trained young men since before the Civil War, would have to take females into its ranks. The Constitution of the United States, which which required the equal protection of the laws for all persons, including women, demanded it. Few people listening knew that Ginsburg got to speak for the court that morning because her sister-in-law, O'Connor, had decided she should. After the justices vote to admit, voted to admit women to VMI at their regular conference, the most senior member of the majority had the right to assign the opinion to any justice who agreed. He assigned it to the senior woman, Sandra Day O'Connor, but she would not take it. She knew who had labored as a Supreme Court lawyer at the American Civil Liberties Union from 1970 to 1980 to get the court to call women equal, and now the job was done. This should be Ruth's, she said. On decision day, justices do not read their whole opinions, which can often run to scores of pages. That morning, Ginsburg chose to include in her summary reading a reference to Justice O'Connor's 1982 opinion in Hogan versus Mississippi. That had been a case which had prohibited Mississippi from segregating the sexes in the state's public nursing schools. O'Connor's opinion for the closely divided court in Hogan, Ginsburg reminded the listeners, had laid down the rule that states may not close entrance gates based on fixed notions concerning the roles and abilities of males and females. And then Ginsburg, the legendarily undemonstrative justice, paused and lifting her eyes from the text, met the glance of her predecessor across the bench. She thought of the legacy the two were building together and nodded. Justice Ginsburg resumed reading the opinion. Every woman in America was in the courtroom that June day in 1996. Whether you were a Supreme Court lawyer or a stay-at-home mom, pro-choice or pro-life, single or married, having sex in the city or getting ready for a purity ball, in their journey to that day and on that day, these women changed your life. And so, of course, changed the lives of men. Justices O'Connor and Ginsburg have a stunning history of achievement in a wide range of legal decisions. But Sisters-in-Law tells the story of how together, at the pinnacle of legal power, they made women equal before the law. They argued for equality, they were the living manifestations of equality, and because they took power before the revolution was over, they were in the unprecedented position of ordering equality. When women are treated as equals, as author Gail Collins memorably said in her best-selling book, everything changes. Hirschman begins her narrative with accounts of two of the two women's early lives. Uh, it was filled with experiences that taught them uh, what it takes to succeed, what it would take to succeed in the world in which they were living. The first is in is at the Day family's Lazy Bee Ranch in dusty southeast Arizona, where the family raised cattle. Sandra was the oldest child of Harry, whom she called D.A., and Ada May Day. And so I'll read you a little humorous section that I think is um, will tell you a little bit about Sandra. <clears throat> Hang on just a moment. It was not easy being Harry Day's favorite kid. When she was 15, she was driving the ranch truck across the unmapped terrain of the huge isolated ranch to bring lunch to her father and the crew when she got a flat tire. I knew, she recalls, no one would be coming along the road either way to help. If the tire was to be changed, I had to do it. But when she jacked it up, the lug nuts were stuck and she could not get the tire off. 
Finally, I decided I, ha I would have to let the truck down until the truck rested on the ground again. I pushed with all my might, but the lug nuts would not loosen. Finally, I stood on the lug wrench and tried to jump a little on it to create more force. Joy, it worked. I started the engine and continued on, but, quote, it was late. When she arrived at the work site, I could see D.A., but he didn't acknowledge my presence. She set out the lunch she had brought, and then I waited. The crew finished branding and came over to eat. You're late, said D.A. I know, I said. I had a flat tire, and I had to change it. You should have started earlier, said D.A. <laughs> Sorry, D.A., I didn't expect a flat. I really had expected a word of praise for changing the tire. But to the contrary, I realized that only one thing was expected an on-time lunch. Uh, within a year of the flat tire incident, Sandra left the ranch for Stanford. Sandra Day cut quite a swath when she appeared in 1946 at the ripe age of 16. One of her dorm mates tells the story of how the girl from a remote Arizona ranch by way of an obscure El Paso private high school quickly rose to the top of the social order. She had the most gorgeous clothes, and after the first school dance, she came back with this really cute guy, Andy, a returning vet who had a red convertible. We were blown away. The Lazy Bee must have been a powerful experience. Uh, even though after Sandra Day turned six, she, she, lit, she didn't really live on the ranch full time because she was sent to El Paso for school. But all those years later, Justice O'Connor still called herself just a cowgirl. Um, Ruth Bader lived miles away uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Her father, Nathan, had come from Russia and had followed the Jewish immigrant path of going into the garment uh, business. Her mother, Celia Bader, who had been raised Orthodox Jew, taught Ruth, she says, more about the tradition of justice rather than the more rigid rules of the Jewish faith. <clears throat> From grammar school, the future Harvard law student was already distinguishing herself. When she got to James Madison High School nine years later, she took up baton twirling and became a cheerleader. Now, when I was in school, I could, could not do both. I'm very jealous of that. <laughs> No mere bookish nerd, the Honor Society member and secretary to the English department chair joined the orchestra, the school newspaper, and the pep squad. It all sounds quite idyllic, except that her mother was dying. Celia Bader had her first treatment for cervical cancer just as the 14-year-old began her freshman year, and she died the day before graduation. Ruth used to sit in the sick room during, doing her homework. More than 40 years later, Ginsburg stood in the White House Rose Garden with President Bill Clinton to accept her nomination to the Supreme Court of the United States. After the future justice thanked all the people who had made her nomination possible, she concluded, I have a last thank you. It's to my mother. My mother was the bravest and strongest person I have known, who was taken from me much too soon. I pray that I may be all that she would have been had she lived in an age when women could aspire and achieve, and daughters are cherished as much as sons. From high school, uh, Ruth went on to Cornell. It was only two uh, of the Ivy League schools who accepted and admitted men and women and would allow them to go to classes together. And needless to say, smart girls abounded at Cornell. Uh, there was a little money for her to go to school, but uh, Ruth got lots of scholarship help. And so um, I think the author says that both Sandra Day and Ruth were really participating in one of the greatest fem uh, transformations in American history, the college education of the female children of immigrants and the working class. Ginsburg's mother, the strongest and bravest person Ginsburg knew, had gone to work at age 15 to send her brother to college. But my, like millions of girls in the post-war prosperity, her daughter Ruth went to college herself. Ruth was called, I love this, uh, by her friends as Kiki, 
when you think about her now, you just do not think of Kiki. But Kiki was to all appearances a conventional college co-ed. She appeared in her sorority house picture dressed in a buttoned up cardigan over a straight skirt topped off with a trendy little tie. A pretty popular sorority girl in the outfit du jour, Ruth already understood, understood very well what it took to get along. <clears throat> now, once, uh, once Sandra Day gets to Stanford, Stanford in terms of status was uh, not, not on par at this point with Harvard, Yale, and some of the other Ivy Leagues, but it did not take long, and it's because it had some very progressive leadership. And so Sandra Day, knowing that she wanted to go into law school, decided to, to remain at Stanford. Uh, she, she finished Stanford Law School in two years, which some of you lawyers know that's a, that's a feat. It really is. You're really, you have to be dug in for, for those two years to get through. Um, but I think that uh, she, was, she was very smart. She was editor of the Law Review. She was elected to the Order of the Coif, which is an uh, honorary society, and very popular. They said she was a very popular questioner in the class. That, and she just never seemed to realize that being a woman could pose a problem for her as she sought to realize her potential. There were only four women in her class and only two on the Law Review. She, it says that she never experienced any type of hazing or rude questions about, you know, taking up a place uh, that a man would want. Uh, everybody loved Sandra, uh, especially John O'Connor III, the dashing, handsome son of a San Francisco physician. He was a year behind her in law school. They spent an evening together uh, in the romantic pursuit of proofreading and citation checking for a law review article. Having the idea that a beer might help things, they took the draft to Donna's shack, a, a diner there near campus, and they never dated anyone else. This is the interesting part. When she came out of law school, one of the top in her class, she just really did not think she would have a problem finding a job. Her early life had prepared her uh, to expect to do anything uh, as long as she did the work and made no excuses. And um, I think being embedded in an isolated family life and educated sort of in the rising waters of the um, post-war West, she was raised outside of society's prescribed hierarchy, a sort of wild child. Uh, as graduation loomed, Law firm jobs were posted on the bulletin board at school. She started to phone around. This is Sandra Day. I saw your job posting on the Stanford bulletin board, and I'd like to apply. Well, we didn't mean women. We don't hire women. After 40 or more exchanges, the young lawyer made a signature move. She rattled her network and asked a college friend to arrange an interview with the friend's dad, a big deal at a law firm, California law firm. This firm, her friend's father told her, has never hired a woman lawyer. I don't see the day when we will. Our clients wouldn't stand for it. Well, now, he saw her, I'm sure her face was very disappointed. He said, well, Maybe, maybe you'd just like me to explore whether you could, we could find you a place here as a legal secretary. No, I don't think so. Thank you. And I think she said, I think in many times when I've read or heard when she's spoken, she references this story and about how shocked she was. Uh, she was, she really felt like because of her work she was entitled to the same consideration, and she was, that, that men received. Um, now, this is Sandra Day was getting the bad news. Uh, Ruth Bader was starting down the same road. She was going to Harvard, um, where her husband was already a year ahead. And her husband, she selected early, as the book says, Martin Ginsburg. And... Um, they were married early on and um, looked forward to being in law school together. He was the only young man she ever dated. 
and she always said he was the one man he, who cared that she had a brain. Fast friends from their first blonde date at Cornell, they became engaged in two years and arranged to marry when Ruth graduated a year, uh, a year after Marty got out. Fortunately, Ruth, who was first in her class at Cornell, had no trouble getting into Harvard. But in good 1950s fashion, the future feminist leader put her legal education on hold when Marty was drafted out of Harvard and the young couple headed off to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, while she was there, she, she had to take a very modest job at the Social Security office near the base. And when her supervisor found out that she was pregnant, the supervisor said, well, you can't fly to the training session for your, because she was getting promoted because you're pregnant. So it cost her, uh, you know, money, real money at that time. Of course, she didn't sue. In 1954, the Supreme Court told the nation that states could not segregate the races, but nothing the government supervisor did to women was considered illegal in 1955. Ginsburg gave birth to her first child, a daughter, Jane, that year, and a few years after, they returned to Harvard Law School. Uh, Marty to resume his second year and Ruth is in her first year. And really what, what followed at Harvard is mind-blowing now, but uh, there was a professor, Erwin Griswold, who gave a dinner party to find out how the women in the law school class justified taking a place a man would otherwise have had. This really makes me mad. It does. It does. Uh, in due course, Griswold at, at that dinner called on Ginsburg to justify her presence in the law school. And to her lifelong astonishment and shame, the future feminist icon answered the dean, it's important for wives to understand their husband's work. Totally not Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But it... I, I can't imagine what that must have felt like to be put on the spot. I mean, it was a, it was still a very hostile environment, no matter the fact that she was the top student from Cornell. It just amazes me. The problem was that uh, when Marty graduated, he went, he got a job in New York, and at at the time there was some consideration given to students who had completed two years at Harvard that they, if they went to another law school for for whatever reason they could still transfer the degree and you would have a degree from Harvard. But they refused Ruth this and so she went to Columbia and really never looked back. And I think somebody asked her uh, if she ever planned to, you know, that once that things changed, did she plan to trade in her Columbia degree for a Harvard degree? And she said she just smiled and shook her head. So uh, Sandra's first job as a lawyer was with the San Mateo County, uh, was with, with San Mateo County as a deputy attorney. She worked for free until some funds became available and she shared a desk this entire time with the county attorney secretary. Eventually she earned a little salary but she left to accompany her husband to Europe when he was serving with the Army's lawyers there. And fortunately she found her second professional uh, opportunity as a government lawyer for the Army Quartermaster's Corps. Uh, upon the couple's return to Phoenix in 1957, she opened her own law practice but then left it to stay uh, at home with her two young sons. And it was at that time she threw herself into Republican politics. Uh, she continued um, a lifelong practice of being a, a man's man and a girl's girl. She fit in anywhere. She became a Republican Party precincts committee person and eventually the, vi the county vice chairman. At the same time, she joined the, junior, uh, the Phoenix Junior League and quickly rose to become president of this very powerful volunteer organization. She later became the first woman assistant state attorney, <coughs> attorney general, then went on to become a state senator and state court judge. <coughs> now Ruth, when she graduated from Columbia, she was recommended by some of, the, of Harvard and Columbia's top faculty for a prestigious Supreme Court clerkship. She was rejected by Justice Felix Frankfurter 
because, as he said so eloquently, I'm not hiring a woman. <laughs> she eventually found her um, way into academia at Rutgers Law School, and um, she was she got pregnant there, and she was kind of forced to start wearing big clothes uh, because she didn't she wanted to get tenure. And apparently, if you were pregnant, you didn't get tenure. Now, yeah. now, doesn't that just make you mad? Um, <laughs> But I think her, her, her biggest contribution before being appointed to the court was that she served as um, most of her legal career at the American Civil Liberties Union. She was, she was the advocate for the advancement of uh, gender equality and women's rights. And she served as its general counsel in the 1970s before she was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to the U.S. Court of Appeals. All these major, major advances for women. Um, the book is really at its most compelling when it juxtaposes both these extraordinary women's careers before joining the court against the women's rights movement more broadly. Both of them, however, used their experiences of discrimination to inspire the use of the law as a tool for establishing equality. Although both O'Connor and Ginsburg in many ways really led very conventional lives in the 1960s. Um, their decisions to pursue a career while married and having a family were anything but. Even so, they were, I, I, I consider them more pioneers rather than radicals. Part of the Republican establishment in Arizona, O'Connor targeted discrimination against women from her position as a state senator. Ginsburg, committed to social change, pursued that change through a meticulously crafted and executed legal strategy that sought to convince the nine men on the Supreme Court that laws which discriminated based on sex should be treated the same as laws which discriminated on the basis of race. <clears throat> I think one of the most unexpected bonuses that I took from this book is that the reader really gets a fantastic sense of how social movements infiltrate the law at a micro level. We know that, my, that social movements find expression in the law, but there are very few accounts about how that happens. How lawyers who care more about the cause than the case meticulously manage the litigation so as to bring incremental change that adds up to a shift in the legal landscape and how hard that is to do when the one who is attempting to shift the change is operating under the very conditions of disempowerment that the litigation is trying to change. Ginsburg's clever and graceful responses to these challenges alone really make this book a worthwhile read and honestly it broke down for me I think about our civil rights movement, the women's movement, any movement. There's a Me Too movement, you know, going on now. There is somebody that is really looking at what needs to be accomplished in a strategic way. And I know that w Ruth Ginsburg often, when she was advocating for some of the changes before the Supreme Court, was very particular about what cases needed to go first, what needed to follow, that she knew that oftentimes a broad sweep was never going to, it was never going to make it. But if you start whittling away, our civil rights movement is the same. There were people there who were strategically working in the law to make things change. I don't think anyone uh, is more responsible for the revolution, the legal revolution um, uh, in the women's movement than Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sandra Day O'Connor. When Ruth began litigating cases, or when they both began, women were excluded from some of the nation's top colleges. They had trouble uh, obtaining credit in their own name, and they could be fired from their jobs from becoming pregnant. Thousands of laws constrained Americans' opportunities on the basis of sex. Ginsburg developed a simple but powerful argument against these laws. 
She argued that the Constitution's equal protection guarantee forbids the state to push men and women into, into traditional sex roles. Over the course of a decade, she convinced the court that laws that reflect or reinforce the stereotypical notion that men will act as society's breadwinners and women as its caregivers violate our nation's deep commitment to equality. Today, this anti-stereotyping approach, which it's not completely realized, is the law of the land. Hirschman argues that O'Connor, too, played a critical, if less celebrated, role in the development of sex discrimination laws. In the 1980s, when the court shifted rightward, it was O'Connor who prevented it from backsliding, or backsliding too far in this area. And again, um, in the Hogan, Mississippi case, this was when a Mississippi man sued after being denied to a public women's nursing school. It was O'Connor who declared the sex-based exclusion unconstitutional, finding that it reinforced fixed notions concerning the roles and abilities of males and females. In 1993, when many believed that the court would overturn Roe v. Wade, it was O'Connor who not only helped to preserve the decision, but also expanded the constitutional basis for reproductive rights by holding that a spousal notification requirement violated women's equality. The two women's power to enact social change reaches a crescendo when O'Connor, followed by Ginsburg 12 years later, ascend to the highest court in the land. And I mean, we all remember this in 1980, Ronald Reagan campaigned on a pledge that he would appoint a woman to the Supreme Court. His aides tried to talk him out of it, but he did persist. But he had not found the right person to, until he laid eyes on uh, State Appellate Judge Sandra Day O'Connor, a fellow Westerner for whom he felt an immediate affinity. Horses were a big topic between the two. They both, they both loved horses, and they loved the West. The path for Ginsburg was a little more difficult. President Clinton wasn't really interested in Ginsburg, saying that she, he'd heard she was a cold fish. But after meeting her, isn't that a nice thing to hear about yourself? But after meeting her, uh, Clinton was smitten and told his counsel, Bernard Nussbaum, that he'd made up his mind, but wanted to watch the Arkansas basketball game before calling her. <laughs> Speaking of stereotypes, I'm not going to comment on that. No. Nussbaum, nonetheless, phoned her. And he said to her, don't go to bed early. And Nussbaum says he heard her start to cry. Just a minute, I have, my, I have my numbers here. Okay. I read this as a conclusion. They were not soul sisters. O'Connor, the uncomplaining, open-faced, cheerful, and energetic Westerner, was easy for her brethren to accept in 1981. As Justice John Paul Stevens said four decades later, she never complained or asked for special treatment and she got her work in on time. She never held us up. Ginsburg, the brilliant, solitary alumna of the feminist movement, brought an unwavering vision of the Constitution and a lifetime of experience in movement politics when she arrived. She chose chambers on a different floor than all the other justices in order to get nicer digs. She likes luxury. If she didn't get what she wanted from the court, she openly pitched an appeal to Congress or used the media uh, to uh, change public opinion. But they were sisters-in-law. Ginsburg has said a thousand times how glad she was that O'Connor was there to greet her in 1993 and how lonely she was after her colleague retired 12 years later. This is the story of how, much, how such an unlikely pair came to nod at each other from the highest tribunal in America as they finished the work of transforming the legal status of American women. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Did it comment on Ginsburg's friendship with Scalia? 
It does. It does in here. It, the book is very, there's a lot of information in here. And there is a, the relationship that she had with Scalia, of course, was you had the most liberal person on the court and the most conservative, but they became friends because of opera. They adored opera. And um, I think after he died, the other members of the court were very sympathetic to her because they recognized that uh, she, you know, she had experienced a great loss in that friendship. And Judge, uh, I think it was Judge Kennedy, who hated going to any social event, volunteered to take her to the opera. So. <laughs> Do you know, I don't know. Does anybody know that? I do not know if Felix Frankfurter was. Was Felix Frankfurter from Memphis, Tennessee? Is he from Memphis? I'm not sure. I don't like him anymore. I, I can't remember his opinions, but uh, uh, we certainly studied. He was, you know, a, an author of many opinions in law school, but I don't remember where he's from. But he did not think women should be on the court. So. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your attention and the chance to be with you again.